Well, welcome. Tonight, we're going to explore the county jail and some of the things that are going on that you'd never think of. Uh, incredible programs that we're seeing. So why don't we start with an introduction? Al, Sheriff how are you? Doing great. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me on tonight. So now, the first thing I've got to start with because it seems to be a great program. Not that all your programs aren't great, mm -hmm. but I'm seeing you feed the county. Yeah. What's going on with that program? Well, thank you because we've been doing a lot of this stuff just this very week and over the last months of COVID. Um, we have a very successful, the most successful organic farm program in corrections in Massachusetts. Um, we started this program we're very proud of. But when I was elected sheriff, believe it or not, Al, it's, it was over 10 years ago. Oh, my I'm God. My 10th year now as sheriff. So um, when we got elected, one of the things I wanted to do was have an organic farm because I thought we sit, if you haven't been out to the jail, the Worcester County House of Correction sits on 13 acres. So, I mean, I'm sorry, sits on 300 acres. And there's a nice parcel that we could farm of about 13 to 15 acres. So when I first got elected, we started a conversation and I started to uh, recruit people at the jail who would like to run a program, an ag agricultural program. And we very quickly started up a program where we grew uh, organic vegetables uh, really for the jail. And it was a way to get the inmates basically run by the officers, but through the inmate labor, we're able to get these, uh, these, these, these farms uh, active and, and very successful. So we started off farming about 10 acres and we were producing between 15 and 20,000 pounds of organic food. And back in 2011, 12, 13, this was mostly squash, zucchini, things like that. But what we're able to do is we noticed that the, uh, the inmates love the program. They like to be part of something special. They felt they were getting a skill and also, you know, getting outside. So it was the, the, certain inmates were eligible for this program. You have to be well behaved. You have to be a sentenced inmate, nonviolent offender. These are the same inmates that live in a separate housing building that go into the community, as you know, and do inmate work labor in the community. Uh, they get the dignity and self-respect that comes from getting out, doing work, uh, getting that sense of satisfaction, the appreciation of the community. Well, other guys stay behind and they work at the jail and the organic farm. And in the ensuing 10 years, we've we've continued to increase the growing at this uh, this farm, Al, from what I said was initially about 10 acres. Now we're farming 14 acres. And I'm really proud to say that our produce has not only expanded in what we grow, which is zucchini, squash, tomatoes, green beans, uh, um, acorn squash. We do... Um, eggplant, we do, there's some pumpkins, we do corn. We continue to add things and we increase the acreage. And this year, we're up to 40,000 pounds of organic produce. Um, it's grown at the jail. We feed the inmate population there with as much of it as you know we feel necessary. Um, and we've been able to distribute thousands and thousands of pounds of food to food pantries, to senior centers. And we've been really focused with COVID is a way to kind of stay in touch with the community. Many people are feeling isolated. We've not been able to do a lot of programs that we normally do, like a summer picnic. We have the senior picnic, which has over a thousand people. We were looking for a way to stay connected to the community. So we did a major distribution this year. Uh, on average, close to 500 pounds of organic food, food distributed throughout this community on a daily basis. Last week, I was out in Milford. Today, as a matter of fact, I. I took the opportunity to go out and make a distribution to West Boylston, to Clinton, and then to Athol. Tomorrow, we're doing the Worcester Housing Authority. We're distributing food to approximately 50 to 100 families. So this is an extraordinary program, and this is the best part, Al. I know you'll appreciate, but we've got this program down to essentially seed money, and then the labor that we have and the machinery we already have, it only costs us about $400, $425 a year to produce 40,000 pounds of beautiful organic vegetables to feed the inmates and to feed the community. So that's what we've been doing. And um, people are very appreciative of 
receiving these wonderful nutritious vegetables uh, and also knowing that it came from a, a special place of the jail giving back to the community. Well, that's got to save you a fortune in your budget. Yeah, I mean, it, I'm really proud of the program. It saves us a lot of money. Um, one thing we hear about the community, Al, is that a lot of these, uh, the senior centers, for example, you know, like we, we love Kathy down in Milford and and uh, we talk to her all the time. And so many people tell us this is like giving medicine to people, like fresh organic vegetables. Sometimes many people have never had them and we're able to grow them in such an abundance that we can distribute them. Uh, I said, both feeding the inmate population and the community. It's really special. And it also, you know, it gets us out, gets us to see people, let them know we're getting through this together. We'll be back soon enough and, and back to our regular routines. Uh, but in the meantime, it gives us a chance to touch uh, this community because, you know, as sheriff, you know, we have 60 towns in Worcester County. And it's important for me to stay in touch with all those communities. And, and this through the farm is a really special way to do it. And I appreciate you mentioning it because we're right in the middle of it right now. I mean, we're in peak growth season and the vegetables are being harvested every day. Matter of fact, uh, one thing, we have a senior picnic, which is the largest in New England. And we put it on for the seniors. Uh, free of charge for them. We do it at SAC Park in Shrewsbury. I've done it every year. I we've started by Sheriff Mike Flynn many years ago. We've made it enormous and frankly, uh, and, and a spectacle practically. We used to call it like woods, you know, senior Woodstock practically, you know. <laughs> but we grew corn it this year because we have trouble sometimes getting donated corn or the crop comes in late. So we've had trouble getting the corn. So this year we grew the corn ourselves at the jail. And it was all ready to go. And then we could not have the senior picnic because of, you know, the, the crowded conditions of the seniors that really get packed into a very small area. We have over a thousand. So we had a large distribution of corn too, Al. This is our first year of distributing beautiful organic corn. And with 1,200 years, we expected to grow for the picnic. That's allowed us to distribute a lot of corn as well. So it's a really wonderful program. And I, and I have to say this because I, I didn't mention it earlier. But this program was really spearheaded by Lieutenant David Callagher at the jail. He loved this program. He retired about three, four years ago. And he said, could I come back on a part-time basis and help the, with the farm? And we worked out an arrangement where we worked small seasonal hours, but to work on the farm. And unfortunately, he got cancer. He got a very aggressive lung cancer. And he passed away very quickly. But we so were just so appreciative of what he did. We we. We dedicated the farm to Lieutenant Dave Callagher. We had his family out there for the dedication ceremony. We have a beautiful sign out there now. And we have two guys, particularly uh, at the jail, um, Johnny Trafaglio and Sean Mullaney. They have dedicated themselves to make this program not only as good as it ever was, but better. And part of that is a legacy to Dave Callagher. We call him the three-decker farmer because he was from Worcester. He grew up in a three-decker. But he loved the farm. He loved the impact it had on people's lives. And his family knew how much he loved it. And it meant the world to them that we named it after him. I think it was the first time we ever named anything at the jail over anybody who wasn't, a, you know, perhaps a former sheriff or something. But he was that special of a guy. And I always think of him when we go out and distribute this produce, Al. It's really in, in memory of, of Dave Callagher, Lieutenant Callagher, his love for the farming program and the community. And it's a way to keep his legacy alive. So it's a very special program for us. And I really have to tip my cap to those two officers that really have continued this program. We haven't missed a beat and it wasn't easy. Now, I can see the advantage to the state, to the county. I mean, you're saving us a lot of money. Yeah. Um, what's the advantage to an inmate? Why do I want to get up and go work if I can yeah. just sit around and do nothing? Well, you know, I guess my first response would be, I think I'm probably correct to assume you've never spent much time behind bars. Um, no. Right. So neither have I, by the way. But, you know, what you find in the inmates are, first of all, it's a select group of inmates. We, we have a work release building, which is maximum 70 people. And right now with COVID, our numbers are down substantially. But these are people who are put in a separate housing unit. It's a minimal security unit because these guys are sentenced. Most of them have an average of less than six months left in their sentence. They're people who are nonviolent offenders, and we believe they've earned a well-behaved, and we believe they've earned the right, and it's a right to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, not a right, it's a privilege. They've earned the privilege 
to get out into the community and give back. And these inmates who were in that building, all of them are engaged in work, whether it be on the jail property, at the farm, in the community. And I'll, I'll sum up this program. If I had to tell one story, it was one of my former inmates who was out on a work program for months and I'd see him regularly. And one day I happened to ask him, I said, you know, how, how's this program? How do you like being part of this program? And he said, Sheriff, I want to thank you for letting me be part of this work program because I never had a job in my whole life. He said, I grew up, you know, in the city and I didn't really have an opportunity to get involved with the right people. And I never had a job and I came here and I've been in and out a few times, but you gave me a chance to work in this program, Sheriff. And Every day I look forward to that officer coming down the blocks and getting me up at six o'clock and getting me out, transporting me out to this work site. And every day I go there, I get a feeling of dignity and self-worth. And, and the community also thank the people. They work with them. These inmates, you know, but for the grace of God, many of them, you know, have had tough upbringings and they're looking to turn their lives around. These are the people we put in the program. And this inmate said to me, go share for the first time in my life, I have the dignity and self-respect that comes from working every day. I can't wait to get out. I want to make my family proud. And this is the word that spreads among inmates. They know that this program is helpful. It'll help you. It gives you something to do. I don't think I don't think many people just want to sit around in a cell all day if they could do something more productive, especially outside um, when they know they're giving back to the community. I mean, a lot of these guys that we work with, I said, these are our best inmates. You know, we don't coddle people at the jail. We don't put anybody in this program. It's not like, hey, you want to get out, go ahead out. Not by a long shot. These people have proven their willingness to turn their lives around, to be well behaved, to to have nonviolent offenses. And we give them that privilege of going out in the community. And I'll tell you this, Al. I've heard a few, very few criticisms, but there are always people out there that want to criticize everything. And they tell me, oh, it's so unfair. You do this to these inmates. You force their labor let me tell you one thing. No inmate is forced to do anything around there other than serve their sentence. If they don't want to participate in this program, they don't participate in it. Someone else will take their place. If they don't want to participate in, um, you know, substance abuse programming or educational program or vocational skill program that we have, that's their choice. They're the ones who are missing out. They're the ones who are losing. And I'll tell you, in 10 years of being sheriff, we have invested in those programs. We have some of the finest employees you'd ever meet. And these employees have gotten through to a lot of inmates and told them, we will help you. If you meet us halfway, we'll help you get out and turn your life around. And I can't tell you how many inmates have taken advantage of this. And, and in all, all candor, Al, it wasn't always like this up at the jail. I ran against the culture of a lot of patronage, uh, you know, a lot of politics, and I, I promised the people who were good enough to elect me, we would make this a professional place. We, we raised the hiring standards immediately to the highest in the state of Massachusetts. You can't even get considered for employment at our jail unless you have a college education or you've served your country. That takes a lot of people off the table, a lot of patronage off the table. And then we set up a very stringent system on promotions where you don't have to, you know, no expectation of holding signs. You cannot write a check to me. I was going to say, if you kept to your promise that you're not going to get your employees to donate to your reelection campaign if they want to get promoted. Al, I can absolutely promise you 100% uh, that is not wavered for one second. I am so proud of that because it, every sheriff should, every elected official should do that. No one who works for them should ever be expected to contribute. Matter of fact, they should be precluded from because that allows everyone to be on the same playing field. And then you can make the decisions based on work performance. So if you get promoted in the 10 years that, that our administration has been there, I can promise you, promise you, you earned it. You, you brought a great attitude to work every day. You work hard. And you've demonstrated a willingness to invest in yourself and this job to better the Worcester County Sheriff's Department. Because, Al, at the end of the day, if every inmate gets out of the jail, everyone that turns their life around, everyone that wants to take a different approach, everyone that doesn't go back to their old ways, we all win. The community is safer, but the inmate wins. The inmate's family wins. The inmate's community wins. And it's hard work. I want to I be clear. God, the, the staff we have up there, Al, is so unbelievable. Uh, I'm so proud to work with these men and women every day who put their lives on the line. 
they work in the blocks, they work in the classrooms, they work in substance abuse, they work in the community transporting. Um, it's a phenomenal operation and we're doing great work and we're really partnering with a lot of our community partners, the DA, the local police, uh, and the homeless shelters, the, the, the substance abuse community. We're all in this together and we're trying to make our community a better, safer place, Al, because if you don't live in a safe community, what do you got? Right. What, I mean, what business wants to come to a community that's not safe? What, what, what family wants to send their child to a school that's not safe? Who wants to live in a community where you can't walk down the street safely? I think it's the essence of who we are as a society. And I know that the work the Worcester County Sheriff's Office is doing is playing a role in the public safety of the citizens of this county. And I want to say I'm very grateful for this opportunity. I hadn't thought about if I had the option of sitting in a cell yeah. or getting out in fresh air, I guess sitting in the cell for months and months and months, I guess it would affect me and I'd want to behave and earn the right to go out, even if I'm working, just to be outside in the fresh air. Yeah, I think it goes deeper than that, Al. The one thing I've learned, especially through being sheriff, is I think everyone yearns for the dignity and self-respect of, of working and having purpose in their day. And I'm really tired of, of politics and programs and things that just get people dependent on them. I mean, right. I don't, that's what people want. I think the average person doesn't want to be handed things. They want to earn things. The average person doesn't want to be dependent on government. They want to get independence from government. But too many of our programs are set up where, I'll give you an example, I've talked to many inmates who've spent generations in public housing, generations on public assistance. I don't see compassion in those programs. I see failure, and I think we have to do better. We have to, people want to do better. Uh, all the inmates I know are, are proud and excited about getting out of their cell, getting an opportunity to give back, going to work, and feeling productive, and then that uh, they only, they describe to me the sense of dignity and self-respect that comes from working that I don't think I ever appreciated before until I talked to people who've never had that experience and they get it and they want to keep it. And I think that stands for everybody in society. I just think we have too many government programs that have failed people and made them dependent and it's not fair to them and we can do better. Now I've read some of your press releases, but I want you to explain, you know, when you hear we have to let all the prisoners out of jail because they're all going to be infected with COVID. They're all jammed together and there's no way around it. Well, that's what they were saying. Um, well, let's talk. Let's 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 talk in the real world for a minute, because we all know that when COVID first hit, you know, especially initially, it was extremely stressful for all of us, for our families, for ourselves, for, for our community. And it still is on some level, but we've learned a lot. But I can tell you one thing, when we, when we uh, had COVID hit Massachusetts, I can't think of anybody and particularly our department that took it more seriously. We were led to believe that our population would be at risk because of you know, the confined con conditions we are in. So we went above and beyond from way before any protocols came in. We had the foresight to order so many various cleaning supplies. We got the inmates and the officers working together daily, cleaning our place top to bottom. We had hand sanitizers. We had everything to clean the cells, the floors. The place has been spotless from, the, from February and March. And we noticed that there was no, we kept waiting for the possible, you know, in, in, in you know, uh, COVID to explode or at least to take hold at the jail, like everybody thought it might. But there's always been a lingering group who have wanted people to be let out of jail. There's always been groups of people, political reasons or humanitarian, whatever their reasons are, that think we over incarcerate and we should let most people out of prison and it's, it's inhumanitarian to do so. And I just want to set the record clear. Massachusetts has one of, if not the lowest incarceration states in the United States of America. Is that right? Oh, yeah. We are in the bottom five. We don't, you, it takes a lot to get sentenced to jail in Massachusetts. Okay? You've got to earn, you've got to really work hard and earn the right yeah. to have free room and board. Yeah, you don't get in very easily. you got to really work at it. And I mean, you either have to commit a very 
serious offense early or you have to be a multiple repeat offender. But then you end up incarcerated or you get arrested and you, you can't you know, bail yourself out. So you're either pre-trial or you're sentenced. But let's start off with the concept that we're not over incarcerating in Massachusetts. We have the we have one of the lowest in the country and we have a very progressive uh, system in Massachusetts where we offer a lot of programming. We try to get ahead of the curve and we try to work very hard with our inmates because we've tried in the past, you know, throw away the key, lock them up. Um, those didn't work too well. I don't know anybody that wants to build more prisons. So what we have to do is we have to be smart on crime. I mean, I'm a former prosecutor. I'm a former state attorney. I'm tough as crime on anybody I know, but I'm also trying to be smart on crime and I'm a compassionate person and I want to do what works. And what works is getting people who are sentenced or are incarcerated opportunities to turn their lives around, not to be coddled, but to give an opportunity. But the reality is, back to your original question, is that we are not an over-incarcerated state. And the people incarcerated, we have great responsibilities. The sheriff's responsibility, we always say this when we meet, and we talk for many months during COVID, the sheriff's had a daily conference call, then it was three times a week, now it's weekly. But we were comparing notes, we were making sure we we're doing all the right things. We were very protective because our essence of our job, Al, is what they call care, custody, and control of our inmate population. It's our responsibility to take care of these people. So we take that with the utmost seriousness. And when COVID hit, we doubled and tripled down on that responsibility. So we were really proud of the fact we had no COVID outbreaks. We had no major problems whatsoever at the jail. And I was making the argument that I think people are in an ironic twist were safer incarcerated than they were in the streets because the people in our jail are isolated. They have daily medical care if they need it. They have regular food. And they're, and they're not going to be exposed to many people because the only people coming from the outside were our employees, and that was it. And, but, but then again, under that situation, we had your usual crowd who wanted to have people released from jails. They went to the Supreme Judicial Court. They filed motion after motion to mass release uh, people from jail. We called it mass decarcer incarceration. I could not have been more opposed to it. First of all, I know the people who are incarcerated and they, they belong in prison, most of them. And I also know that they're safer in prison. So myself and the sheriff unanimously opposed this. We filed briefs against it. Uh, and it was essentially based on the fact of the safety of the inmates and that they were not getting sick in jail and they were posing a greater risk to themselves and to the community outside. And, and I'll give it a caveat. Of course, if there were high risk categories, we were willing to work with the district attorney and the judges to release certain people. And I'll give you an example, a nonviolent offender, uh, perhaps on a low bail who was 65, 70 years old, or someone who had a pre-existing diabetic condition or somebody who was greatly at risk if they got sick. Of course, we would consider a case by case basis. But these people, Al, they were filing motions that said, any pretrial person should be released. Anybody who's got less than six months left in their sentence should be released. Mass release of inmates. That was crazy. But wait a minute, Lou. You're saying I went to court to say you got to release the prisoners because it's unsafe in jail. And the data is showing me that it's safer in jail than out in the general park. Well, What's the logic? Yeah, no, I, I agreed 100%. And and I am proud to say, remember, this was when the, the data was still coming in. So there were people looking for, you know, evidence from a, oh, a prison in, you know, Arkansas had 10 people got COVID and, and one of them had to go to the hospital. We've got to, we've got to let everybody out. It was like that kind of crazy evidence. There was no real evidence to show this problem. And it may have been outbreaks, maybe in other parts of the country. I can only tell you what I've heard. Massachusetts, we've had very, very few, if any, um, very few people brought to hospitals outside. We have our own facilities. Uh, and in the sheriff's, I don't know if we've had any fatalities. I think the Department of Corrections had maybe one or two, and they were people with major pre-existing conditions and other complications. But the irony of this whole thing, Al, which is this is the part you're not going to believe. We were getting into this March, April, May, no COVIDs. We had maybe, I think we had 
eight or nine cases the first few months, all were employees. They were people who were quarantined and isolated. Once we identified, they were positive. If they got a positive test outside, they wouldn't come in. Um, we had no inmates testing positive. Now, were we testing every inmate? Absolutely not. I mean, they were asymptomatic. They were isolated. They, if you came into the jail, you, we put you in a special unit for 14 days. So if you happen to have a symptom or problem, we would identify it before you were put in general population. So we did everything right. We had no COVIDs, and I believe it was in June, a judge had ordered an individual out who had a pre-existing problem. I mean, in the sense of history of criminal fraud behavior, we opposed it. The district attorney opposed it. Uh, the judge released this guy, and ironically, within a week, that guy had recommitted a, an offense in the community and was back incarcerated. And when we tested him upon his return, guess what? He was our yeah. first positive for COVID. So he had no COVID. He was isolated for a crime. They put him back in the population. He commits the crime again, and he gets COVID? And he comes back with our first case of COVID. Um, so to protect these inmates by getting them out in the community, you actually expose the guy to COVID who got it, and he committed another crime and came back. Now, I'm proud to say there have been a lot of people in law enforcement, every sheriff, I think all but one district attorney were 100% opposed to this early release of, of people other than a simple case by case basis. That's what the SJC, that's the Supreme Judicial Court ordered a case by case review. But a lot of attorneys, a lot were bringing dozens and hundreds of cases before the courts. I think the courts have overall done a pretty good job. But you know, we've heard of people uh, who have been released and recommitted some some crimes. And as a matter of fact, on a separate issue, which is a big story just last month, there's a group called the Mass Bail Fund. Have you heard about them? Barely. There's a group called the Mass Bail Fund who have decided that nobody should be in jail on a bail. Right. And they collected a lot of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they will randomly, now this is crazy, I'm telling you, randomly come to the jail post a bail for someone and get them out. And I met an inmate who was walking out the jail one night at like 5.30. I stopped and talked to him. I said, where are you going? He's like, I, I don't know. I have nowhere to go. I said, what do you mean? He goes, when we got people to be released, Al, if we knew someone was wrapping up their sentence or getting released, we have a reentry team that will help these people have a place to live, try to help them with any programming they need, whether it be substance abuse or something like that. If they need to find employment, we can defer them to our, we have a, um, we have an external team that deals with post-release people. We have a systematic way to get people released from prison to protect them. This guy just gets a knock on his cell one day. The officer says, you just got bailed out. He doesn't know how, he doesn't know why. I ask him where he's going. He goes, I have nowhere to go. I actually helped the guy get transportation to, to a friend's house. So he has somewhere to go because the guy was absolutely shell-shocked and this is how they work. Well, there was a very controversial thing that happened recently that really blew up on them as it should have. They released, they, they put, I believe it was $10,000 bail on a, on a sexual offender. I believe he was accused of rape. He got out and reoffended. He raped another woman, allegedly. He's back incarcerated. There's a woman out there, I believe I, her life will never be the same. And you know, this fund did not take the responsibility for that. They just moved on. A lot of people who were funding them have backed out now, saying, we didn't know they were doing this. This is unacceptable. We had no idea. But this is the kind of craziness that's going on. And I just think we as a society, look, we're focused on one thing. Sheriffs are focused on one thing. We don't believe people are over-incarcerated in Massachusetts. Those who come here have earned their way in. Our job is to take care of them and to help them if they're going to be uh, released back to the community, help them get the skills to be better, behave better people, make their families proud, and be responsible citizens when they get out. That's what we do. And that's the end of the game, beginning and the end of the game. We're all in this, as I said before, together to make our community a better place, safer place for business, for, for the families, for the community. Um, but there's always people who want to fight us, you know? But, you know, I guess I don't understand the logic. You put a prisoner or somebody, you bail them out, and then you just leave them. I mean, luckily, I've never had to worry about being able to 
get a dinner. You can look at my rotundness, and that's proof enough. But I don't know what I would do. I like to believe I wouldn't do anything bad, but if I was starving or couldn't get help or it's cold out there and I need a place to stay, I don't know how I would react. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You know, thank, thankfully, yourself and I have not been in that situation. And who knows? But, you know, we don't know how people react. But, you know, we obviously have to hold people accountable. And, um, you know, but also I said, if someone was to simply need food or housing, it's unlikely they'd end up incarcerated unless they violently or, you know, with a firearm or something held someone up for, you know, for money or stole from them. Well, that would be a different situation. But, you know, I always say this, but for the grace of God, go I, I don't judge people in my jail. I mean, they've been judged. They've been judged. They've been to court. They've been judged. I tell every employee, every team member we've got, and it's our, not our job anymore. Our job is to reach those inmates that want to reach us, have, meet us halfway and see if they want to turn their lives around. And if they do, it's hard work. We're willing to meet you halfway and help you get out and do better, make your family proud, make our community safer. And if you're not, nothing I can do, Al. They can stay in that cell 20, you know, 20 plus hours a day. That's their choice. We offer opportunities uh, for a better life if they want to take it. Now, some obviously are have felony charges and could end up in state prison for you know decades uh that is possible there are some of those in our care and custody and control but the majority of people we have will be sentenced and released back to the community now this whole movement you know where people are screaming to defund and trying to paint all police as bad how does that affect the jail staff well Right now, it hasn't impacted us because I don't think anybody's felt the fiscal effects of COVID. Um, I know that sheriffs have traditionally been, by a small segment of the legislature, not very popular. Uh, that crowd who are more likely to say we over-incarcerate, which, as I've said already many times with you, is not the case. But they believe it. Uh, and maybe there are examples of people who perhaps were incarcerated and shouldn't have been or arrested and uh, disproportionate numbers that I'll agree with with those assessments. But well, what does that have to do with your role? It doesn't. That was my point. It's like I don't because the only thing I'm worried about is when this when COVID the dust settles and and I don't believe we've we've scratched the surface yet as far as the fiscal impact of this thing because the federal government has been writing some big checks. We're talking trillions of dollars that we're going to have to pay back, and I don't know how the states are going to be impacted, but. I expect there's going to be some significant cutbacks in state government, federal government. Well, that could come back on the sheriffs. And it depends on how the legislature looks at law enforcement. And if they see us as part of the problem, which I can't believe they would, but some do, then it could impact our funding levels. I would say we all feel in law enforcement a little bit, well, definitely put upon in the fact that we're perceived by many people to be the problem or the enemy, when I don't think anything could be further from the truth the majority, overwhelming majority of us in law enforcement are compassionate, caring people. There are certainly been a history, which I, I certainly acknowledge of injustices that have occurred in this country and, 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 and some elements of racism that do exist today that we have to address and do better at. But the idea that a few bad cops, and there are some out there and that have been recorded now and created significant situations that need to be addressed, if that can broad base paint us all in a bad light is just unfair and it's not accurate. Um, and I think it does more harm than good. So I'm concerned, but I'm also, you know, I think we have to take this opportunity as a society to improve and get better and acknowledge some of the pre-existing problems that we've had. I mean, I agree that there have been some injustices, uh, particularly in other parts of the country. I, I so again, back to Massachusetts, I think we're different than many parts of the country. I think we're ahead of the curve. I know we have been in running correctional facilities. I don't think many states have been as progressive as we've been when it comes toward educational opportunities, um, substance abuse programming, giving people culinary skills, trying to re-enter people by making sure they have housing, uh, job opportunities. I mean, we work hard here because we know what works and we've been a tremendous asset to help people in the criminal justice system. We're not, you know, we're, we're not, we're not, you can't ignore crime, but you can try to reduce it and help those in the system who want to help themselves. 
I think that's what we do in Massachusetts. I know in Worcester County, I work with so many of our local law enforcement officials and the overwhelming majority of them are well respected by their communities and they work real hard to help people. They're, they're public servants and we shouldn't be just, you know, broad based painted in a negative light because of some very serious problems that have occurred uh, in other parts of the country, some in, in our community as well. But that's not the majority. That's not the, the, the majority of, of of incidents that occur in interacting the community and the police departments. I think that's just a small amount. And again, happy to look at it and address it. But I think we have to take a look at the whole system as a whole and realize there's a lot of good being done. I get confused because, you know, it was a tragedy where a person was shot. I don't know enough of the details to really have an informed opinion. But then I read that a vigilante came in and shot two people in the crowd. I was listening to, I think it was CNN this morning, when a person was screaming about the need to defund the police. And at the same, before the show was over or his interview was over, he was saying that the police blew this thing last night because they should have had two or three times more cops there to protect the looters. I, I get confused. I mean, we want cops. We don't want cops. I mean, I believe there's probably a percent of the police officers that aren't up to the standards we would like. But I, I find it hard to condemn the other 99 percent. Well, I mean, you put your finger on it. I mean, let's be honest. There's a political agenda with a lot of people. Some of the media have their, you know, I mean, as it once was, I read a book once about a, uh, a, a guy who was an executive director at National Public Radio, and he took a year off to visit conservative America. And he, he acknowledged in the book, he said, people in, in, in his station, for example, are naturally drawn to certain stories. They want to report them, and they're not interested in other stories that may be not of their same political pos uh, position. I think we have a lot of that going on, and people want to select the stories that interest them, and they want to ignore the stories that don't. And it's not a very fair and balanced look at what's going on. There's nothing we can do about that, Al. I mean, I don't know what what we can do about it other than just continue to do good work, continue to strive to be better. Um, I'm I'm feeling frustrated at the same as same as you are in, in many of those many of those uh, situations. I mean, even you've put out a press release about the tragic uh, death of George Floyd. I don't think anybody can argue that. No, I mean, it was an absolute tragedy and then there've been others and there'll probably unfortunately be more um, and we got to do better. And, and I'll tell you what I think the essence of it is, Al. I believe we need to work to get, if you want to hold people accountable for, if they're a bad officer or an obvious situation where the officer did not act properly, there should be a better way to deal with it. Because right now, when I have problems with the jail, for example, everybody's eligible for arbitration. I can't get rid of people that need to go because an arbitrator will order them back and I'll get sued. And that's the problem. It's so difficult with the, with the arbitration system and the union protections to get rid of bad people. And that's where I think we have to go take a hard look at how we can focus on the bad apples and hold them accountable and get them off our, uh, get, get them off our payroll and off our, our, our staff. It's really challenging under the collective bargaining agreements we have to live with and many people that we have seen, and I've seen some personally, I was not comfortable working in, inside the facility or, or in our department, but we were ordered to take them back. That's happened many, many times. And that's, the, that's what we need to say, hey, how do we improve that? How do we change that situation? That's, that's, the, and that's why we had George Floyd, in my opinion. I'm not prejudging those officers. It just seems like there were some mistakes made during that, as we've seen others. Yeah, but if but, it wasn't George Floyd, it was the George Floyds that have suffered. Of course. I, I find it amazing that in a state of Massachusetts where we have at-will employees, mm -hmm. as a commercial entity, I don't need a reason to fire somebody. That's right. I, I can let them go just on performance. Yep. You're not doing the job well. Right. Unless I work for a municipality or the state. Right. There, you can't fire anybody. Well, that's what I'm saying is that's the problem in my mind is, you know, some of these, you know, bad apples, bad actors have a history. We know they are, but they're still there. 
this needs to be addressed, but everybody seems to be, you know, everybody's on the window dressing and making politics out of it and trying to use it to their advantage. Instead of dealing with the direct essence of the issue in front of us, we have people who have a history of being problematic, whether they be police officers or whatever, but that's a very problematic position to have a problem in because of your responsibility, the power, and the, the fact you carry a firearm. We've got to identify if we have people who have been problematic, we have to deal with them more directly and not get into a situation where people are unfireable or have all these rights that make it very difficult. And then you end up in a situation like this. I mean, if an officer was in a one-time situation, something happened, there's no way you could foresee that. But we've seen cases of people who have a history. And also, I don't want to get in a situation now where people are getting accused now left and right who didn't do anything wrong because they're trying to create a history. It's very complicated. But it's something we do need to address. And I don't know if it's being addressed in the right way right now. I think it's become part of this political arena. And I'm tired of the political arena. I just want to re get results and, and move forward with a better system. Well, I mean, I, I get a kick out of this defund the police. Right. I want to know if any of these people have actually worked on law enforcement budgets. Because... Every police chief I've ever worked with, if you cut his budget, the first thing that goes is training. He doesn't kill. He doesn't let go of his staff. Right. So wait a minute. If anything, we should get better training, more training. And yet, if we defund them arbitrarily, they're going to cut the training. I I don't get it. Well, you you can't. I and I think the I think one of the other things that people, at least what I believe. And I don't know for a fact, I, I can't poll people or, you know, interview everybody. But I can tell you this, I, as a former prosecutor, as someone who's a state prosecutor and then a district attorney and now a sheriff, I see where the crimes occur, where people come to my facility. And they happen in a lot of communities that need more policing, good policing. And the people in that community want policing. But for some reason, there's a big movement of people that want to defund police and eliminate police. And the people that live in those communities who are most impacted, I don't think they overwhelmingly agree with that. I, I find that's the irony of it. It's like, you know, we need to have safe communities and we need good policing. And that's what we should be focused on, not defunding and eliminating police departments, especially in the communities that are most impacted by it and need good policing uh, to be safe. Um, I, it, my heart breaks for any family, any family, whether they live you know, in the most rural part of America or an inner, inner city, wherever they live, that they don't feel safe and secure in their place of, you know, where they live, where they send their kids to school, where they go to work. Um, and I mean, you know, in the safe, in the sense of a community safety, but also to say from police, of course. And that's what we can do. But we can do this. We have been doing a pretty good job. We can do a better job. But I think there's a lot of a lot of communities that don't want the funded and eliminated police, they want good policing. Well, you know, we went through a whole discussion about, do you want police in your schools? Obviously, nobody wants to need a police officer in the school. But two years ago, at the finance committee level here in town, we were presented with a program to add four SWAT officers in our schools. And what hit me was the average incident, the average horrible incident is 18 minutes long. And it was going to take on average 42 minutes to get a SWAT team to Milford. I looked at our chairman. I said, God help us if we vote against this and anything ever happens. How would you look at any of the parents in the face and say, we voted against this? And I don't know if it'll fix it. But I know if I didn't give it a shot, it won't fix it. So, you know, again, I think you're right. When you start looking at, do we want police officers? Oh, no. World peace should happen and kumbaya. Everybody should only do wonderful things and we wouldn't need police. Well, until that happens, I think we still need our officers. Yeah, I mean, I think the vast majority of people agree with that. And all, we're, all people are asking for is, we have the best police officers who do the job most responsibly. And that's what we've got to, we can improve on that. And that's, so I think the learning lesson here that we need to work on. Um, and I think we are. Let's pick something fun. 
Yeah. Doggies in the uh, jail. Yeah. Talk to me about the doggy program. Well, I, 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 I don't know if you were aware, but today is National Dog Day, so it's a perfectly appropriate conversation. But, you know, when we came to the jail, uh, our administration, we had a few canines in the, in the jail that were used for drug detection, narcotics detection, security. Um, but they were retiring. They were older. I mean, 10 plus years old and they were retiring and we didn't really have the resources to replace them. And I remember, you know, in my staff meeting, we had a conversation. This was rarely early on. Like, I mean, I, I was sworn into office in January of 11. And I think this was in, you know, the spring of 11. It came very quickly. Um, and I just said to the team, I remember this saying, we, we can find a way. We're going to keep canines at that facility because, you know, we use them. We don't have like German shepherds that are there. They're like attack people. We have, you know, we have dogs that are used for narcotics detection. An example, when you run a correctional facility out, it's a 24-7, 365. Somebody's trying to sneak something in. Somebody's trying to stick it in through the mail. Somebody's trying to throw it over the fence. Someone's trying to smuggle it in their body every day. It goes without saying. So I was not going to allow our situation to be without the proper you know, dogs that were necessary, but we had to be creative. So we found through some research, we found that there were dogs that are can be trained. They're, they're shelter dogs. They're actually adopted from shelters. They're mixed breed dogs. They're small. They're like 30, 35 pounds. They're mixed breed. They can be trained to be the most sophisticated narcotics detection dogs in the country. We could, we could adopt them for nothing, which we've done. And we got- Yeah, but plus you're taking them off death row. Yeah, we, well, exactly. We did. We took them off death row. We gave them a second chance. We brought them to the jail. What's interesting about this program, Al, is these dogs, they live with the officer and his family. The officer adopts the dog. Ah. He lives with them at the family. He comes to work every day with the, uh, with the he, gets a, he gets a cruiser with the uh, canine unit in it. So he's on call 24 seven and all for the community, by the way, not just at the jail. He works for the people of Worcester County. And we, our first our first dog, you know, we got in. Um, he ended up coming into the facility, got trained. We trained him at the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department at no cost. We got him at no cost from Sterling Animal Shelter. And we actually have uh, veterinary care offered through the Holden Veterinary Clinic uh, for free. And so it's really almost a no cost program. This dog had become one of the most sophisticated narcotics detection dogs. Um, first day on the job, he was sniffing the mail and found that there was somebody trying to sneak Suboxone, which is like a synthetic heroin, trying to sneak it into the facility on the glue of an envelope. He picked right up on it. We flagged it. He said, what he does, Alan, if I brought him in, you wouldn't want him to sit down next to you because if he sits down, that means he's hit something. Uh -huh. but, yeah, but his, his name was Nikita. He's still, he's still with us. He's probably, you know, nine years old now. It's hard to believe, um, but nine, 10 years old, but We've since then, uh, we have about five or six canines we've adopted all for free, trained for free, live with the officers, beautiful family pets, very happy dogs, but they work for the people of Worcester County and they do great work for us. And we have another program similar, but again, an adopted dog that we use for Bloodhound. So we didn't have the resources for Bloodhound, but like you just mentioned about schools and, and kids and stuff, I didn't want to be the sheriff that said we don't have a kid, we don't have a bloodhound if a child went missing uh, or an inmate was to, you know, escape or, you know, knock on wood or something like that. So we've been able to maintain the bloodhound program as well. And, and I'll tell you this, that bloodhound gets called out regularly by local police departments, um, by families that have called the local police because they have missing a loved one, whether an older person with Alzheimer's or a kid or someone disappears. We have had many, many uses of uh, of this of this canine, and uh, and she she's amazing. We don't publicize any of these. These are very private situations. Their families that are in, in fear, and we just want to help. So you won't read about it, but I'll promise you, she's out there working hard every day. And many many times she's called in. I remember one point she found a a, a child who had kind of run away from home and but had some disabilities and um, found in the water, but they didn't know. Uh, this child had gone into the water. Um, so really fascinating. So, but, but that's, that's only half the story. So that's our canine program at the jail. 
but we also started what I what I love is a second program because we the dogs were so good. I've always believed there's a lot of literature that says that dogs, particularly pets, but dogs are very beneficial to ther for therapy for people, including inmates. So we started a program in that same building, the work release building. We made dogs available through a shelter that we partnered with. They have dogs. They're a no-kill facility. They have their full. They have dogs that are unadoptable because they have slight behavioral issues. They jump up. They're not trained uh, for potty training. Um, they nip. There's things that just are problematic to get them adopted. They bring the dogs to the jail. We buddy the dog up with two inmates. They live with the inmate. The inmate trains them. The inmate walks them. The inmate learns all this stuff. They get trained. This shelter provides food and training for free. And again, these dogs, today we have three. I was just visiting them this week um, for National Dog Day. And we have three in, that, in the work release building now. They live with the inmate. They bond with the inmate. Um, they, I, I'm really, this is the best part of the story. Not only have the officers told me that the blocks have never been safer since these dogs arrived because they make everybody chill out. The dogs can kind of walk around. It's a lower security facility. So the dogs and the inmates are walking around more than any other place. They kind of get adopted by the whole block and everybody kind of chills out. The officers tell me, Sheriff never felt safer, never been less threatened, never had an easier time diffusing situations than since the dogs got here. And then the ultimate kicker is we're about 80 dogs that we've had over the seven years or so we've done this program. And we've had 80 adoptions, 80. Every dog has been adopted. Um, most initially were all by our employees. They were so wonderful. The employees would see them walking around um, outside in the yard and they'd ask about them and they'd look to adopt them. So it's an amazing program. And, um, you know, it's a special program to have this kind of thing. It's all done for nothing. And at the same time is it helps the inmate who changed their behavior. They change his people when they bond with a dog. The officers love the program and all the adoptions we've had. So again, it's a really great program. I'm very grateful to the team at the jail who have really taken this program and run with it because it's very successful. And, you know, we've had, at the one year anniversary we had uh, our first year, we had the program, we invited all the Boston media and they all came. It was on Fox, on channel 25, uh, channel four, five, seven, four. All these stations came out for this really good news story. The families brought the dogs back. Some of the inmates were actually still here and you know remembered their dogs. Um, it was moving and it was special. And we've continued to do this. I said, I lose track because it's been so many years, but it's a wonderful program. Both of these canine programs, I've presented at national conferences and people have been overwhelmed at these programs. They're not real familiar with them and they're only done by a few departments, but I hope the people in you know, Milford and, 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 and the com community appreciate the fact that, that their sheriff's department is taking a leadership role when it comes to animals and incarceration uh, and how to do it right. Well, the fact that you're saving these pups, yeah. I mean, too many of them are on that limited time if the shelter's full. Exactly. So actually, in my mind, you're taking them off death row and giving them a chance at life. Yeah, no, we, we're very proud of that because, and I'm telling you, we've not had one dog that was, that was not, you know, retrainable, that wasn't able to be put into a, a good space to be adopted. And I'm telling you, I remember the last time I asked, we were well into the 70s. And that was that was months ago. And I just came over and we get new pups all the time. They're usually they're usually younger dogs between one and two years. I mean, zero and two years old. Occasionally we got a few older dogs, but most of them are younger. But they're beautiful dogs. And, you know, we've had no we've had very few issues in adopting them. As a matter of fact, initially we had a, so many people wanting to adopt them. We had to kind of, you know, figure out who we get them. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Now, you keep talking about this special section, the low security. How many inmates are in there versus the whole jail? Yeah, well, things have changed in the last few months with COVID, and, and we don't know what they're going to be like going forward. I can, I'll give you a history of it because that's all we can base it on. So our jail was built... A little history lesson for the for the folks of, of Worcester County. 
Our jail was originally in downtown Worcester, right across from the uh, post office downtown. And in 1973, they built the facility in West Boylston. It's kind of in a remote area. Um, most people don't know where it is, but it's kind of close to Worcester Country Club. But they built it in 1973, and they built it for 800 inmates. And pretty soon, they had a lot more than 800 inmates. So they had to build a modular region, and that means they doubled the size of the facility. Um, but they built it with modular buildings, which meant temporary buildings in 1991 out, 1991. Well, here we are in 2020, these modular units, which were supposedly built for five to 10 years to get us to the new building, have never been taken off site. That's what we've got. In the meantime, our inmate population went as high, not when I was sheriff, thankfully. When I was sheriff, it capped off about 1400 1450 but it went as high as 1600 which was way over capacity people were doubled tripled up there were people like bunked up in 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 the gymnasiums and things and there was actually a lawsuit filed and an agreement made between the prior sheriff's department and 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 the Worcester County Sheriff's Department and the the feds to cap our number at 1451 inmates we cannot house more than that Thankfully, we've never had to exceed that in my time. We've been close. Mondays, oftentimes, you get a lot of people over the weekend arrested. We'll get 30, 40, 50 people come into the jail on Monday from the courts. But anyway, the answer to your question is, we've averaged around 1,100 inmates in my time. There have been some criminal justice reforms, some of which I supported, uh, bail reviews, things like that, lower bails, depending on the people. We saw the numbers trickling down below 1,000 fairly regularly over the last two years, but around between 900 and 1,000, then COVID hit. And during that time, this work release building, which is where the lowest security inmates are, they're sentenced, they're nonviolent, they have uh, good behavior at the jail, they fit the criteria for people, and we have, a, we have a team that evaluates every inmate, and they recommend them for the work release building, and they, they also recommend them to work in the community so you've got people who are, we can safely put out in the community with our officers who we're not worried about. So most of my time as sheriff in the last 10 years, that's been about 60 people, 70 people. The building holds 70 people. We've averaged probably between 50 and 60 because sometimes you can't get a good enough good inmates to classify mm -hmm. in that lowest level security. And we can't put somebody in there who doesn't belong in there. So it's always been in that 50, 60 range, which meant that we had 15 or 20 inmates to send out in the community to do work. We had, you know, a half dozen or so to work on the farm. We had another half dozen or so to help with the grounds, um, some for the dogs. You know, we had a good assortment of inmates that were eligible to do these programs. Well, now with COVID, our numbers, because and there's no other way I can describe this than other than the whole system shut down. The courts have, they really haven't even reopened yet, which... I don't understand, frankly, that's, it's, it, it, we're ready for business and maybe Boston and some parts of Middlesex County had higher concerns over COVID, but Worcester County and West, we were ready for far more regular business than we've been allowed to do, particularly in the courts. So without the courts being really open, the police departments were not as uh, aggressive in arresting people. And we saw a remarkable, dramatic drop off in inmates coming to the jail. We went from an average of, you know, maybe 50 to 70 inmates a week coming in, maybe 100 to 10 to 5. Wow. So we saw our population go because remember now, a lot of the inmates, we're talking about April, May, June, they wrap up their sentence. They get out. We don't hold people beyond their sentence. Then you had those dozen or more inmates that were released by the courts because they felt they were at risk and should be released. So they got out and then you had people oh. who were bailed out and the bail fund. And before we knew it, our inmate population had never been below 800, not even once, not for years, suddenly was in the 600s and then the 500s. Well, we're going to have to stop now. We could go on forever, but our time was up. Sheriff Lou, it's amazing what you're doing. It's amazing that it was 10 years ago you came on when you were oh, sure. going for sheriff. I still remember that first show. But 
All I can say is thank you for everything you do for Milford and the community. And I always look forward to hearing what you got going on. No, thanks, Al. You know, I'll come on anytime. I love coming on with you and thank you for everything you do as well. And to our six loyal viewers, as always, may God bless. May tomorrow be a better day than today. Good night and thank you for joining us. Not too long since I've been home